<laughs> Welcome, everyone. I am joining you now from my phone because of the technical difficulty. But <laughs> thank you all for joining us. It is a pleasure to have you. We are really looking forward to this conversation. My name is Autumn McDonald, and I am the head of New America California. New America California focuses on issues of economic equity, and we are always looking to elevate worker voice and think about issues of income and what it looks like for people to thrive in the state and nationally. I am joined by uh, three fantastic guests, and I'm actually going to let them each introduce themselves to you, so I'm not going to go into their background right now. But I did want to let you know that the format for this session will be that we'll be in conversation, I'll ask some questions, and then there will be a period at the end for each of you to ask questions. So uh, without that, with, with that rather, let us begin. I'm going to start with uh, Lenny. And Lenny, if you will just tell us kind of the two-minute story of you um, and what it is that leads you to be interested in this topic. Thank you, Autumn. I'm delighted to be here with you and with New America. And it's particularly a delight to see Hirad's face on the screen since we've spoken many times, but I haven't seen you live in a while. So it's good to talk to you. Um, I'm uh, Lenny Mendonca, I was most recently the Chief Economic and Business Advisor for Gover Governor Gavin Newsom in California. Uh, prior to that, I was with McKinsey for um, 30 years, where, among other things, I chaired their McKinsey Global Institute for a decade and led their strategy practice, and I was previously the chairman of New America. Uh, this conversation to me is very exciting to think about how we can uh, turn away from capitalism, but recognize that capitalism is a continuously evolving mechanism by which we help make society work. And if we're at those one of those important times in that history where we need to have a bold set of thinking and execution against how we really make it work, because it is desperately challenged at this point in time. And I think the conversation we'll have will be uh, instructive to how we might be able to move in a direction that reimagines capitalism for the environment that we're in today. Okay, great. Thank you for that, Lenny. I appreciate it. Um, Hirad, if you would do the same, we would love to hear a little bit about your background and um, your interest in this area. Thank you. Sure, happy to. Good to see you uh, again, Autumn, after having this conversation a few months back, and you, Jess, as well, and Lenny, wonderful as ever to you see your smiling face. Um, so I, I think this is a critically important conversation at a critically important moment in time to have it. There's probably not been since the history of capitalism a bigger opening for its transformation than I think we're facing today. Uh, how long that window will be open and, and you know, to what extent the, the potential will continue to exist, I, you know, I think is an important question. Probably leads um, to at least it leads me to thinking that it's it's quite narrow and, and there's a sense of urgency now uh, that hasn't been there in, uh, in the past. I, I've been at this for over 30 years now. Um, the organization I'm with is called the Fourth Sector Group. We are a global NGO. Our focus is building an enabling ecosystem for purpose-driven enterprises, so businesses that follow a purpose-first logic. Um, yeah, and. Again, delighted to be in this conversation. Thanks so much. Can you hear me okay now, still? Okay, great. And now, Jess, if you would tell us a little bit about uh, your story and uh, also what brings you to this conversation. Thanks so much for having um, me, Autumn, and um, great to see you both as well. Um, yeah, I definitely resonate with there hasn't been a bigger opening in this kind of unique moment that we're in. And I'm here with um, B-Lab, um, which is a nonprofit organization that serves the movement of people using business as a force for good. And um, uh, really specifically, um, we do that through B Corp certification and through um, benefit corp governance, which I'm sure we'll talk about as we talk about stakeholder capitalism, which is just a mechanism that allows companies to operate differently. Um, and, and essentially what we're working to do is reform capitalism. And um, I think in this moment, we see how important that reformation is um, to achieving our vision of an inclusive and equitable and a regenerative world. Um, so I specifically work for BLAD US in Canada. I'm based out of California. So really I'm glad to be part of this California conversation. And um, the Bay Area is actually probably the biggest concentration of B Corps in the world. Um, and so a lot of really great examples of how um, this really important actor um, uh, 
business can um, play a difference in impacting its, its stakeholders. So looking forward to this conversation and, and really glad to be here. Thank you all. This is really fantastic because you've already started into this element of what are we really talking about? You mentioned stakeholder capitalism. We hear people talk about reimagining capitalism. And let me alert to the fact that some people think of this as people saying destroy it, you know, blow it all up or not. And I think that um, it's interesting to kind of jump into that. I'd love for each of you to just kind of give your brief understanding of what is what we're talking about here. Kind of the, the kind of quick and dirty, if you will. Some people may have joined us back in February at Salesforce when we started this conversation. Some may not have. Uh, so we would love to just hear how you see this issue, what is part of it and what's not part of it. And uh, if you'll start, you add, that'd be great. Sure, happy to. Um, boy, it's it's uh, the boundaries around this conversation are are kind of fuzzy, and, and they're certainly massive in scale. Um, for us, the, the the thing we're most focused on is basically, you know, capitalism is an economic system that that was invented several centuries ago, and it's been evolving since its, its inception, right? So there's nothing static about it. Uh, but we're at a point where the the prevailing model is, you know, as things evolve, you know, they, they go through sometimes continuous, sometimes discontinuous um, sort of changes. In, uh, and, and I think the moment we're in is one that is requires for certainly discontinuous change. Um, and, and so that's the piece that we're most focused on is what is the next iteration of, of the system that we're, we're trying to make a, a huge leap to in a short period of time. And, and that next iteration of capitalism, if you think about capitalism as basically a system for institutionalizing trade, right? Trading activity is what humans do to, to cooperate in society. One person grows food, another person builds shelter and they trade. So uh, our system of trade is, is basically the, the, the sort of kernel of the economy. And it's been institutionalized several centuries ago when slavery was legal in most of the world. Uh, and the environment was seen as an abundant pool from which we can just freely extract. Several centuries ago, we in invented this institutional structure for trade focused on profit. So private gain um, as, as, the, as the primary objective. And that system you know, has been both the engine of tremendous progress uh, across the world for centuries, but it's also been the engine of, of tremendous harm and degradation to the environment and to the social fabric, because at its core, extraction of value from, from humans and nature basically is baked in. So we're at this point in time where A, that, that while it's been incrementally improving and you can look back and see all kinds of ways that business has taken increasingly more responsibility for its stakeholders and for the environment and society, that continuous path of change and evolution is just not enough because we're in this critical moment in history where we've got more and, and greater and more complex social, environmental, and, and economic challenges than we've ever had to face. Uh, and the institutional structures that, that are basically at hand are the ones that are creating those sets of problems in many ways. So there's no way that, that we can incrementally improve and continue this sort of steady path of evolution. It's, it's time for step change. Our interest is what's on the other side of it. When business goes from a logic of for profit you know, business is the main engine of the economy, to, to, to one that's for purpose or for benefit, what does that actual architecture look like? What is the institutional framework within which it exists? What's the policy architecture and the market architecture? How do we measure and report performance? Unless and until we understand what the end state needs to look like on the other side of this chasm, and unless and until we create the enabling infrastructure for that end state to be able to exist, we can't make the leapfrog that we have to make um, or the leap that we have to make. And we're stuck in this incremental gains, uh, you know, going against exponential losses in, 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 in a time horizon that is, that is rapidly collapsing to zero. So that's where we come at it from. Awesome. Thank awesome. you so much for Thanks that. Thanks so much for that. Okay. 
Okay. Okay. okay. Comedy of errors here. Oh, uh, Jess, if you would be willing to also give us your quick take on, and if you want to respond to anything that Hugh had said, that would be fantastic as well. Uh, love to hear your take on it. Yeah, and I think um, what I'll really just do is build because with this system for institutionalized trade, I think what we've seen is that the business has an impact on the communities that it operates in, on the workers that it employs, um, on the environment, um, and on the customers that, that it has. And as we've seen um, uh, the power of capital markets, the power of corporations grow in this outsized way, we see that the impact that it has, both positive and negative, has grown as well. And so when we talk about stakeholder capitalism, we both talk about it in contrast to shareholder primacy. So, you know, with um, uh, with the kind of rise of an understanding that the role of business is to maximize profit for its shareholders came this kind of at all cost method. And how do you do that? How do you do that most efficiently is through is through extraction, it's through um, decreasing your margins, it's through um, understanding um, that who you are accountable to is only that stakeholder on the other side and only that shareholder. And, and stakeholder capitalism asks the business, asks the corporate sector broadly to look more comprehensively and say, um, your responsibility or accountability isn't just to um, the shareholder, but is to this broader set of stakeholders that um, that both are the drivers of the profits of the business and um, are um, impacted both positively and negatively by the actions that the business has. And so um, stakeholder capitalism is a capitalism that thinks comprehensively about the impacts that a business's operations, that a business model is having on um, the people, the environment um, that it is operating in. And um, we'll talk about this more later, but like within the model of the work that we try to do is create a framework for what stakeholder capitalism looks like and a set of measures for um, holding businesses accountable um, to, to really um, clear sets of practices. Um, both in how it's governed and how it operates. Lenny, I'd love to hear your take and also uh, if there's anything that you think is particular to your uh, vantage point uh, with uh, policies at the state or um, a level. Great, and I will, uh, as Jess did, just build on what's been said because I agree with it as opposed to contrasting with it. Um, I would start with, I, I am a unapologetic capitalist. Um, I do believe the answer of making capitalism work is um, unassailably the right answer as opposed to throwing out capitalism and starting with something else. Um, it is an extraordinarily effective mechanism for allocating capital when the rules of the game are clear about what we're trying to accomplish with the allocation of that capital. Um, the problem has become, and it really got pronounced and accelerated in the uh, beginning with the, the uh, Milton Friedman's set of observations about the purpose of capitalism and then extended through some academic work that Michael Jensen and others did about the primacy of short-term shareholder value that has overweighted the entire system to that objective function. And that has created an enormous imbalance and without the proper legal, regulatory, and political architecture around it, it's led to all the challenges along with the advantages of, of efficient allocation of capital. Um, most pronounced where most people uh, in the world and certainly um, outside the United States believe that this is imbalanced it has to do with the environment. And we are, uh, as uh, if you don't, if you have an externality not priced into the system, that creates a huge problem. And that's what's happening with not ensuring that the cost of environmental degradation is not embedded in the accounting and the economics of business. And movement on that main, whether it's as, as direct as pricing carbon 
or in regulatory mechanisms that accomplish some more things is absolutely essential if we're going to have a planet to live in. Um, less obvious, but extremely important and even more pronounced today is uh, an ineffective use of, of capitalism to allocate the rewards of capitalism. When you've got it reallocated aggressively to short-term capital returns, um, that means that the returns to labor and the returns to those who don't have to have don't happen to have the same degree of capital uh, wealth is is uh, misaligned. And so we have to have a capitalism that has the advantages of being efficient capital allocation, amazing productive at ensuring that we're continuing to create innovation and productivity improvement that allows the world to do better and more with less resource. But it really needs to be one that is incorporating issues of sustainability and resilience or regenerativeness, whatever words you want to use into the planet elements of what we're doing so that this isn't capitalism for short-term capital, but something that can sustain throughout generations and have a, a planet that that uh, regenerates itself as opposed to is extracted from. And it needs to be massively more inclusive. You, it does not work if it's a system that rewards uh, the, a very small portion of, of the population and large portions of it are having their, their labor and their uh, innovation and their intuition and their energy uh, uh, going to the holders of capital. So. I think that's doable. I think if we uh, scale things and reorient the uh, institutional mechanisms to align, I think capital moves quickly. Um, I also think there are increasingly good examples of when that's done, what happens. And so we look forward to continuing the conversation, but I do think the alternative throwing out capitalism is not viable. And what we really need to do is to accelerate the transition to a, a a continually vibrant but more sustainable and inclusive model of capitalism. I think those are great points and the, po the point about sustainability and inclusivity are uh, really poignant ones, especially now as we think about just the state we're in now. However, if we were to go back and think about this issue pre-COVID, uh, I would think about the different challenges that we face to get to where you all are talking about. So we talk about what we would like it to look like, what it, what it looks like when it's when it's working well. Um, and so I'm gonna ask you each to think a little bit about what you think is kind of like the main challenge or obstacle to getting where we wanna get. But at the same time, I want to share my own thought on it, which is, it brings me back to childhood. I grew up on the East Coast. And uh, when it would snow, they would plow all of the snow into the corner at our school yard and a playground in the area. And we would play King of the Mountain. And so, you know, one of us would try, we would all try to get to the very top of the mound of snow. And then we would try to, from there, keep everybody else from taking our spot. So my question to you is, as it relates to the challenge of a cultural piece, you have some people who already have kind of the power at the top of the mountain, if you will. What would it take for there to be more inclusivity uh, if there are others who don't necessarily have the positionality or the power to change how it works? Um, and I'll start with you, Jess. Uh, you want to speak to that challenge or any others that you see? Yep. Um. <laughs> There's a lot of challenges and challenges kind of both at the macroeconomic level. And I think, um, you know, we work with business leaders every day who face challenges at the day-to-day -day level. I think folks who really want to figure out how to operate in this new context, um, who feel enormous pressure um, to kind of continue business as usual. Um, so I think the expectations of business make a really, um, are really powerful in terms of the maintenance of the status quo. And so um, in expectations of investors, short-termism, um, and um, the need to uh, consider in the cost of capital um, and uh, those externalities um, is, um, is really critical. Um, consumer expectations matter. Um, and uh, in this way, kind of the regulatory environment really matters. So the expectations that government has of business as well, um, either creates or 
um, stands in the way of an environment that allows businesses to operate um, in in kind of a different in a different way. Uh, I, I do think, you know, where we come in with a set of incredibly kind of like practical on the ground tools for businesses to operate differently. Um, we see the need to be able to incorporate your business in a way that um, allows you to take into consideration um, uh, stakeholders and not just financial returns. And so the, um, uh, the adoption of benefit corp governance and mechanisms that even just give you permission to make decisions that may not maximize profits um, is really, really important. Um, and then even just uh, models. What, what does a good business look like? What does it look like for, what are the standards um, for um, considerations of your workers, of the environment? What are the best practices? What are innovative ways to address um, challenges around packaging, around um, uh, kind of anything from the, we, we work with a lot of business leaders who really have the desire to um, run and operate their business in a way that takes um, stakeholder consideration seriously and lack the tools and the resources to kind of adopt um, those methods and and that's where we see there's just a lot of need for capacity building. Um, so there's kind of the external pressures, the sticks, and then there's also the carrots and the tools and the resources that, that companies need. Thanks so much for that. Hopefully this audio is a tiny bit better. Uh, <laughs> you had, if you would do the same and just either respond to the challenge I tried to say that maybe many people couldn't hear, which was this idea of king of the mountain from my East Coast days of growing up, the snow all plowed into the corner and people kind of using their positionality to keep others from taking their spot. Um, or you can respond to whatever challenge you feel is kind of the most um, pertinent. Uh, sure. Um, so I think, I mean, the way evolution unfolds is that that there's innovation and there's more fit or more appropriate um, you know, solutions that emerge and those things get to scale because people favor them. So if we want, uh, clearly, I think as, as, as um, we, we've all said and, and, and Jess and, and Lenny have articulated eloquently, we need to shift to a different model of capitalism uh, that is more inclusive and more environmentally regenerative, sustainable, et cetera. So we have to make that change and we got to do it quickly. And Lord knows people are trying, there's many people trying. So um, if, if we want businesses to be more equitable on the other side of this, this bridge we're crossing or economies to, to behave more that way, then all we got to do is look at the existing instances of businesses that are in fact operating on a different kind of logic, right? The, the, and there are plenty of those examples. Many of them are B Corps, many more of them. There's a, a study that came out a few years back saying there's tens of millions of new startup purpose-driven businesses globally. Um, somewhere on the order of 10% of GDP in the US and Europe would be in, in this purpose-driven, values-driven sector of the economy if it were formalized and institutionalized. So we know there's already examples of businesses doing exactly what you're saying ought to be done um, that, that don't have that king of the mountain mentality at all, but have much more inclusive models of ownership and governance and, and just values that drive their decision making throughout their supply chain with their customers and so on. So if we just figure out how to identify those kinds of businesses and we figure out what is it they need to be more effective uh, in their ecosystem, what kind of enabling policy will encourage more of those kinds of businesses or help the existing ones survive in, in, you know, in a competitive landscape where the, the invisible hand favors the opposite kind of decision-making and behavior, right? Uh, that are not inclusive. So, so if we just figure out what it takes for those to, to be more effective and survive, we've figured out the answer to what it takes to transition the economy, I think. That's fantastic. Hearing what both of you have said has really resonated. And I know Lenny, you have said before, you've talked about, excuse me, carrots and sticks. And I'm curious if you would agree that the main piece is kind of like a cultural, how do you get those who are already enjoying kind of the, 
the fruits, whether ill-gotten or not, of uh, a tilted system? Is it just getting people to decide to pursue a kind of different direction and showing why that's advantageous? Or is there something else in your mind? Um, I think it's part of it. Um, certainly a broadly shared understanding of the objective of business and that a long-term oriented stakeholder driven enterprise is actually more effective than a short-term driven shareholder value maximization enterprise um, is and an understanding of that that's embedded in how future business leaders are trained, et cetera, um, is important. So you've had uh, you know 30 or 40 years of business school students, at least in the United States, being trained that their entire objective is to figure out how to make more money for their shareholders in the short term. What do you think is going to happen? Um, but I, I don't think that will become widely shared until you recognize that capitalism doesn't exist in isolation. It exists within the rules of the game. And you have to alter the rules of the game so that you don't have uh, free riders or people taking advantage of the system in the short term and then handing the problem off to somebody else. I think if we get those elements aligned, you will see capitalism move. And remember that um, while this is all huge challenges that need to be uh, adjusted, uh, the last 50 years has also been the largest reduction in extreme poverty in the world, more than the entire history of mankind before that. And so there are elements of this when it's aligned that could really work. But we need to do is make sure that the, the rules of the game align so that people have the, the right incentive, then we'll align their cultures along with that, align the systems, align the training so that you're orienting that way. I mean, I think there are large sectors of the economy that and large enterprises that, and many newer enterprises, as Hirad mentioned, that are, are attempting to do that and would be enabled and uh, create a competitive advantage for them if the rules of the game were aligned to say that's what we're asking you to do as opposed to we're begging you to do it out of um, just the generosity of your heart. That makes a lot of sense to me. You, you brought up this piece of how the elements work together such that you know the system works properly, which, which I've been thinking a lot about in this moment, right? With this moment of, oh, it, we can't really call it a moment, it's an era, the COVID era. You know, you have a lot of people who don't have jobs. You have a lot of people who are determining, you have a lot of kind of state and at the federal level determining how do you provide people with the income that they need or kind of a, a stopgap, if you will, until there's a place where people can kind of get back on their feet. There are all these different elements that come into play when it comes to just having some sort of income, right? You have people who are uh, driving for different, um, you know, the, the, whether it's Instacart or Lyft or Uber, or what have you, you also have all of the different individuals who are trying to figure out, okay, how can I do my job safely? With all of these different things, with COVID coming into it, what does it look like to try to address this in this period of time. And I'll start with you, Lenny, um, if there are thoughts you have on what do we think about now and what we do, if there's anything different. Well, um, again, what we're talking about to enable this whole system to work is not a short-term crisis phenomena that uh, it's much more one that needs to be thought of as how do you alter the entire system so that we get what we want. Um, and that doesn't happen overnight. Uh, I certainly believe that some of the elements of the environment that we're in, and COVID is, is uh, obviously a, a predominant element of that, but the elements uh, in uh, many parts of the world and certainly in many communities in the United States around the challenges of inequality and racism and the unequal distribution of, of uh, wealth and concomitant power um, has put itself front and center at the democratic systems that help determine what those rules of the games are. So if you have um, a, a democracy, some of these elements about what you're trying to accomplish can be in uh, direct conflict with how the power is executed at those who are in charge. And so 
you can either say, well, the answer is we need to go to a much more authoritarian capitalism and create more of the power in the in the government at the center and an all all knowing, all seeing leader. Or you can say, no, let's make the economy work by leveraging what the democracy is at its best and uh, disperse some of that and create a more equal distribution of opportunity. I think the that the it's clear in the US national election that COVID and the economy are front and center about what people are caring about now. And they are recognizing that the way we're operating now is not solving either one of those problems. And so what choice do you want to do about how to solve them? Um, so I don't think that in and of itself, COVID is, a, uh, is positive or negative to what we're describing needs to happen. I think it's obviously a, uh, front and center issue that needs to be dealt with, but it's the, the issues that we're talking about are, are um, much more systemic than a particular uh, uh, pandemic as, as, as uh, problematic as it is. Thanks for that. Uh, Hirad, would you like to share your thoughts as it relates to uh, where we are with COVID as it pertains to this issue, because what Lenny has spoken to is that it really is about changing a larger system, right? A, a, a very large system at that. Mm -hmm. And so do you feel like there's an opportunity now that didn't exist before or the opportunity always existed and it's just something that we need to continue plugging away at? What are the things that you think are different because of where we are right now? Um, I, I think we've had the opportunity for some time now. You know, th there's been decades of innovation in this space and, and, and growing consciousness and awareness that we need to make these kinds of structural reforms. And a lot of great thinking and great ideas and solutions have, have emerged that have not been adopted. So um, I, I do think opportunity has been around, but there is something significant about this moment because first of all, if we had seized these opportunities in the past and had a more sustainable and regenerative and inclusive economy when COVID hit, um, a lot of the, the, um, the, the negative consequences of COVID would have been mitigated, I'm, I'm pretty sure. Um, I think it's, it's made this crisis exponentially worse than it, it could have been or would have been had we made these kinds of structural reforms before. It's in fact surfaced the need for those reforms. So, so now in this moment where trillions are being allocated by governments to try to respond both to the medical crisis, but also to the economic uh, and other, other downstream consequences of it. So as we're spending these trillions globally, we have a choice to either reinforce the failing architecture that got us here, which is the status quo and the default choice before governments, or we can look at the need for structural reform that, that actually we should have done a long time ago, but didn't. Um, and, and for going forward, knowing there's gonna be a lot more crises ahead, surely, um, and, and with greater magnitude and, and amplitude than this one, um, that we need to set ourselves up for better resilience um, and, and start to make the structural reforms that, that we know are needed in order to give us the kind of uh, the, the quality of response when shocks do happen uh, and also set things on the right footing for when we are not in shock, but in fact, in, in moments of, of stability. So I think we, it's the, the COVID uh, question for me is that we should do everything we can not to squander the trillions of dollars in re recovery and, and, and um, you know, response and, and um, stimulus capital that governments are pouring into their economies. We should not squander those resources pursuing approaches that basically put Humpty Dumpty back on the wall. And, and we should leverage this opportunity both for the structural reforms we know are needed and for the diversion of resources to the right kinds of responses that actually bake in this kind of stakeholder, um, sustainable, inclusive, equitable model of business and capitalism. Thanks for that. I, I think that those are really great points. And I'd love to hear, Jess, if you have anything that you would like to add as it relates to, or anything that you'd like to counter and say, I see it this different way, but um, I'd love to hear what, what you see as COVID related to this issue. Yeah, thanks. Um, 
And I think what I want to highlight is even before talking about the opportunities that the impacts um, of COVID-19 and of the recession aren't small and in fact have taken us back um, in incredible ways from an economic and a community development perspective as well as like worker related outcomes. Um, there are um, 1600 B Corps that we work with in the US and Canada um, from what we saw in our community is um, again, who are majority small and medium sized businesses but many of the leading businesses in terms of the practices you think about when you think about stakeholder capitalism. 50% um, were in industries seriously impacted by COVID. 82% um, uh, applied for PPP um, and the repercussions were really outsized. So for us, our average revenue for a white owned B Corp is $26 million, but for a person of color owned B Corp is only $6.6 .6 million. And there were huge barriers to access to PPP for um, black, indigenous and people of color owned businesses um, ha that have limited cash reserves because of um, structural racism. And, um, and all of this has basically exacerbated and set back, um, I think a lot of the really important pathways to entrepreneurship to business creation in communities across the country. Um, and it's gonna take a lot <laughs> to kind of get us back even to where we were, I think, pre-COVID and pre-recession. Um, so if anything, the opportunity is uh, a sense of urgency and a growing awareness. I think both you combine the economic inequality that's growing, the climate crisis, racial justice uprisings, the crumpling of our democracy, kind of all of these things in confluence with each other and, and see if, if this isn't the wake up call that we need to put in the regulatory reforms, the uh, consumer activism, the business activism that is needed to um, push the government to be where it needs to be in terms of um, having the policies in place that would allow us to um, take seriously our, our responsibility to, um, to workers, to our communities, to the environment. Um, that I think is, is the opportunity is, is if this isn't the wake up call, particularly in the US in this moment, I'm not sure what would be. Um, and in fact, we're at risk now of um, needing to rebuild. Um, and we're at a crossroads of deciding how we're gonna do that rebuilding. And if that rebuilding is going to further benefit kind of the top, 5%, the largest companies, um, or if we're going to take seriously our commitment to um, building wealth in um, communities across the country, and particularly communities that have been um, because of structural racism uh, left out of um, opportunities in the past. Thank you so much for that. Uh, so I'm seeing some really great questions starting to come in already. And so I'd love to segue to those, but I did wanna note that at the, before we end, I wanna make sure to ask each of you if there's something specific, some sort of action or closing thought that you will want to uh, share with everyone as they think about the different kind of platforms that they hold or the different network or group of people that they get to speak to. So I just want you to keep in the back of your mind what is the thing that you would want other people to be sharing broadly? How do you want them to kind of engage in this um, for all of those who are attending? But I'll start with one of our first questions. So this is from Carlton Bufford uh, and it says, similar to what we have experienced with COVID-19 and the need for a national economic strategy to win, doesn't stakeholder capitalism require a national economic framework that allows for equitable stakeholder participation and com competition on a national state and local level so that it is excuse me, fair and just everywhere given that, comp excuse me, given that competition is everywhere, COVID is everywhere and it is not controlled by borders or politics. So I think I'm, I'm seeing that as kind of like, what are, what are your thoughts on how we come, up, how we come at this since it, there, is no, there, there are no borders to it? Um, does it need to be national? Does it need to be international? What are we talking about here? Anyone who has an answer for that, feel free to jump in. Um, happy to. I, I think 
It, I think all of the above. It has to just like um, you know the old model of capitalism. It has to work at all scales, um, and and it has to be interoperable at all scales. So we need a, a a policy and market architecture that basically recognizes and and uh, supports a certain class of enterprise that, that uphold the values we've been talking about, and that needs to work at the global level uh, because. Some uh, many companies operate globally in, in multiple jurisdictions. It's got to work at the national level. It's got to work all the way down to local level. Does any have a, anyone have anything to add? Okay, great. Then the next question I have is related to the need for business or. Uh, the market structure, the uh, way we uh, approach economic change or economic transformation to be something that goes beyond a mindset. And so this question is, if we can't expect businesses to transform their mindset on their own, is there a case for strengthening institutions to ensure that government can hold businesses accountable to a new model of capitalism? Um, and what are your ideas on this? So each of you have already mentioned the idea of kind of carrots and sticks, but what are some of the things you imagine are ways that uh, government could be involved in uh, moderating or, or changing how we how we operate this in this way? I, I can add a couple of things on that. Um, number one, they do have to insist on the the appropriate rules of the game to ensure that things are both embedded in how business decisions are made through things like accounting standards and through things like how, what are the expectations for uh, things that are being priced into the, to the economy that are uh, not priced into the economy, just carbon being the most obvious one. But if, we're, if those things are not showing up on your income statements, they're not capitalized on your balance sheet, we don't have standardization and transparency around what the impact of those things would be. And that is not therefore equally and effectively uh, built into the decision making of capital holders and corporations, then you're going to get what you get. And so government has extremely important role in those elements. I also think government obviously has an important role in establishing uh, rules of the game for labor markets, uh, things like standards for uh, that have been uh, effective in driving change in in uh, environmental regulations uh, have been and can be effective in labor regulations as well, whether that's standards for employment, work, work rule hours, wage standards, those sorts of things. Um, and then finally, more broadly, I do think there is a real conversation that needs to be had about how do we really build what is a clearly a uh, objective of the broader population into a much more inclusive society, a much fairer one into those rules of the game. That's more complicated, but it's one that we have to do. And government has a really important role in helping lead that conversation and being serious about it, whether it's it's how we um, uh, uh, do things like what are standards for government contracts, what are standards for government grants, what are the reporting requirements? What are the ways in which we score legislative or ballot measures to say how do they affect or not economic mobility and inclusiveness? You know, all those sorts of things can help move the environment. And then lastly, I do think what uh, is going on today as, as uh, Purod and Jess are at the forefront of, there actually are a lot of enterprises that are operating this way. And there are uh, lots of learnings that happen from those enterprises. So what we need to do is diffuse and scale those things and think about how do you create the mechanisms to make that happen faster and more broadly. Um, I think it's fantastic that there's a uh, huge number of, of for benefit enterprises and B Corps and I happen to live in a part of the world like Jess where a lot of those are, uh, you know, it's, it, it's where that's a lot of innovation happening and a lot of excitement around that. Um, but that needs to be the norm, not the exception. Um, if there are, uh, we should flip it around so that businesses that are operating in that kind of mech in that kind of approach are not disadvantaged, they should be advantaged. 
And that would cause a very different mindset about how we think about all sorts of things and would actually accelerate the diffusion because those sorts of enterprises would have a competitive advantage and not be today often feeling like they're competitive disadvantage from doing the right thing. And I can maybe just add to that um, really briefly that it's, you know, even B Lab, we have very much in the first decade of our existence taken the carrot approach and really said, how do we create a model for um, businesses to measure, manage, um, and have transparency and accountability around their performance? And just this year, we released our first policy agenda saying that that carrot approach isn't enough. Um, we need laws and regulations to require businesses and financial institutions to look beyond their own financial returns. And that was a shift for us in kind of our um, thinking about our role in this conversation. And um, so I can share the link to that, that policy paper and what that policy agenda is. But um, I think it's, uh, it kind of, it, it reflects, I think, both the urgency and the importance and that outsized impact that we're seeing um, corporations have. Um, yeah. Fantastic. Um, and I will basically 100% agree with everything Lenny and Jess have said. Um, and the only thing, I, what I would sharpen is basically, I think what, we're, what Lenny was talking about, I, I just want to draw some sharper contrast to that. The, 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 the market and policy reforms that we need to make in order to change the traditional private sector, so incumbent businesses that are operating on a profit first model. Um, the, the, the architectural shift that needs to be made there is, you know, is pretty deep and substantial. And there's a lot of incumbency and entrenchment and, and legacy structures there that don't turn around very quickly. So the agenda of the reforms for the private sector are one agenda. The agenda for, for reforms that enable the fourth sector, which is this new burgeoning class of for benefit businesses, of which there are millions you know, across the economy and hundreds of millions um, or billions of dollars going into them and you know, the, the tremendous amount of economic activity and, and interest by employees and consumers and so on. That fourth sector of the economy the policy and, and, and market reforms required to enable and recognize and legitimize that are, I think, different. You can go further, faster on four sector reforms than you can on private sector reforms. And so I think having a bifurcated approach, because if you tether the two together, then you only make incremental progress against the incumbents, whereas the innovators that are already way out there, they, they drive on a purpose and equity and sustainability logic and DNA fundamentally, they're gonna be held back because we can only make incremental improvements here and they need exponential reforms to enable what they're trying to do. Thanks for that. All of you have talked a little bit more about the carrots and the sticks and have also been a little bit more specific about what those look like. One of the questions was about what some of those specific incentives might look like. And Lenny, I know you've already rattled off quite a few, uh, but this person in this question has asked about things like tax breaks and government purchasing requirements and government matching funds. And I'm just curious if there are any quick things that you guys want to share as some of the things that you're talking about when you talk about some of these incentives? Uh, Lenny, if you have either a few to add or Hirad and Jess, if there are specific things that were mentioned that you think of as um, the way that people would be incentivized or uh, cautioned against certain type of behavior. So, Sorry, Lenny, I'll start with you. Sure. So um, again, government at all levels, and this is clearly true at the, the national level, it can also be true at a state or local level, particularly for large metropolitan areas or for large states, have uh, can have a very outsized role in moving the market behavior in some of these. So um, in at, at just to do historical examples, um, why is it that companies are 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 um, incorporated in the state of Delaware. Tell me why that's logical for anything other than a set of people in Delaware decided they'd create a legal architecture to create an advantage for incorporating in Delaware. Um, I 
still believe that there's possibility for an equivalent of a state to do that to say we're going to be the home for for benefit enterprises you have to incorporate here and we want you to be headquartered here and if you do that um, here are a set of advantages that come with that then they can be all the things that were listed in that question they can be uh, they could be purchase preference for government contracts and for grants in the same way minority women-owned businesses uh, veterans businesses are with real teeth to them. They could also be uh, elements of tax breaks, or in some cases, they can legitimately be sources of capital, whether that's um, in things like what uh, the uh, proceeds from cap and trade rev uh, revenues have gone to to help reinvest in businesses, either through grants or loans or regulatory incentives to ensure the development of low carbon intensive energy and low carbon intensity activities. I mean, those don't necessarily, and if they're done right, those aren't burdens on society. They're actually moving society in the direction that you want it. So these sorts of things done right, when you have clarity of what you're trying to accomplish and transparency around it, when you have an aligned regulatory and incentive system, and you have a, a private sector who understands and is incented and operates in a way that that can align with that, you can move things. So, you know, California, since the implementation of AB 32 and the and its focus on uh, moving towards a carbon neutral economy, has continued to grow and reduced its energy intensity and its carbon output at the same time. It has become an economy that is not driven and assumed that the net only way you can grow is by being more energy, putting more more uh, pulling more energy out of the ground and putting more carbon in the air. And at the same time, it's created an entire new set of industries, including the number two and probably this year, the number one product export in the state of California will be zero emission vehicles, which didn't exist in an effect in a decade ago. And those that's a very attractive business and created enormous wealth and created a large number of jobs in an, in an industry that didn't exist. And the scale of California, both in terms of its regulatory environment and encouraging other states to adopt those standards create a marketplace for those vehicles and aligned a whole set of its incentives, including uh, tax, including grants, including supporting infrastructure to enable that to happen that much quicker and create a large industry with a, an export product and a large domestic market in and of itself. I think that can be done in other circumstances. And so it's, it, it's really thinking aggressively around how do you align those things in a way that um, uses the full power of government to accomplish what what uh, citizens really wanted to do as opposed to saying we're just going to let the private sector do what it does and the public sector will be left with trying to clean up the bad consequences um i'll add a, a, a completely completely agree with all of that and i would say in addition to the direct action that government can take there's a huge role i, I think government can play in stimulating other actors to engage in, in the fourth sector. So create incentives for investment capital to flow in there, impact investors to um, move more capital in there, create incentives for businesses to align their procurement with for benefit suppliers, uh, for consumers to shift their purchasing behavior, um, you know, provide resources to universities to, to support research and incubation and acceleration of for benefit businesses. There's a huge role that every sector of society can play and government can stimulate all that in the same way that government plays a very active role in stimulating growth in the private sector in those ways. Just shift the focus you know, or widen the aperture and say, okay, here we're doing economic development. Basically success is more and bigger for-profit firms contributing to economic growth. Let's widen the aperture, recognize it for benefit firms also contribute to economic growth while solving all these social and environmental problems and creating less harmful impact. So let's also look at growing more and bigger for benefit firms. How do we stimulate the whole of society essentially to align uh, their economic choices in a way that helps scale the fourth sector? And, and, and I would say if the history books um, were to uh, basically write about a, a first state in the US that, that became the Delaware, or the, the leading state in the US that ended up becoming the Delaware for benefit corporations, it would have to be California on that list. So I think, I think that's the place for this to happen. Thank you. 
Jester, do you want to add anything? No? Okay, great. So I see a question that's related to this window people keep talking about with COVID. Now, each of you mentioned that there was a lot that could happen and was happening before we got to this point. But I'm curious if there are particular opportunities that you think exist because of COVID in reimagining anything? Is this just a time where we're kind of broken down to the studs and it's a good opportunity to reimagine whatever one wishes to reimagine? And if there are any thoughts you have about um, what some of the steps might be for that. Uh, the person didn't ask for specific steps or suggest specific steps, but I'll add a few of my own, which is, are there any opportunities as it relates to small businesses, things we can do or um, startups, uh, businesses that aren't yet at their kind of full, full, full force, but are just beginning their processes. Are there any things we can do? I know Lenny mentioned before, um, business schools and how we train those who are thinking about going into um, into the sector. Are, are there any opportunities that you think exist uh, because of this place where we can kind of rebuild and start over or start differently? Um, two thoughts that come to mind. One is around how we value labor um, and this dialogue of essential services and um, thinking about that as it relates to um, wages, as it relates to minimum and living wage and the opportunity to kind of reassess that and um, both both from the carrots and the sticks side of things um, uh, really use this as an opportunity to think about um, are we, are we are we paying, are we valuing labor the way that it really um, is creating value for, for communities and for our society? And the other is around virtual and flexibility. I think where we've seen a lot of innovation is, you know, kind of in the knowledge base industries and how quickly companies have been able to transition um, to more worker flexibility. Um, and there's opportunity for some of those benefits to extend, I think, beyond knowledge work um, to thinking more creatively um, about worker flexibility and um, with all of the challenges of the gig economy, I think what's represented there is the need that workers have for um, flexibility. Um, and, uh, and there's an opportunity with, with COVID to think, about, um, to think about that in terms of worker needs and uh, job design. Uh, I'll give you two autumn that are mm -hmm. completely different and led by different actors. Um, one is, as Jess mentioned, COVID has accelerated large portions of our, of our economy to a uh, possibility of a future of work that um, is happening at a pace that would not have happened had we not had COVID. Obviously, the number of people doing what we're doing right now, doing this remotely, um, the number of people who are simultaneously having to uh, work childcare and teach out of their home at the same time or elder care. Uh, the dispersion of work outside of a small number of uh, urban tech hubs to being much more dispersed where people are living. Those are all phenomena that would not have happened at the pace and scale were it not for COVID. Um, there are real questions about how do we, as we work through the public health elements of this, get the benefits of those things without the burden being disproportionately borne by uh, and accelerating the inequality and lack of inclusiveness that we've got today. So we really do need to have, and this can happen at some degree at a, a sub-national level, but it definitely needs to happen at the national level is, is what's the future of our care economy. We cannot have an expectation that the entire burden of uh, working, parenting, caring for your elders and educating our, our children are born by working mothers. That's just not gonna work. And so how do we think about that extraordinarily valuable work that is often uncompensated in today's economy? How, what are we gonna do about that? That is an element of something that the current environment um, puts forefront. And I think it's something that um, if you thought about that with a, a different kind of model for what kind of enterprises can help solve that, particularly for benefit enterprises, what would you come up with and how do you accent and accelerate the movement of those enterprises? So that's one example. Another example that's not, that's 
uh, happening organically in the private sector is that there's more and more analytic sophistication happening in how you measure and build into investment decisions, things that are today not capitalized. And so the, as an example, the, 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 uh, uh, in the for benefit enterprise, which is why analytics is trying to figure out how do you help make better private equity investment decisions, but build in on not instead of, but on top of the financial market returns, the value and all the other elements of what are accomplished through that investment, particularly as it relates to environmental poverty reduction, inclusiveness, et cetera. And you see very, very substantial benefits and different decisions made if you do that. And if you really believe there's a large group of investors and some of the smartest ones and most analytically driven ones in the world who believe that those things will create better investment decisions if you're investing for the longer term, that's an area where there's a lot of ripeness for uh, better decision making. And I think that's something that can both move capital and move large blocks of capital, and also something that can be flowed into and taught in our business schools around how do you make those kinds of investing decisions. So those are just two examples of things. I don't want to actually always say that we're in a complete disaster. I think there are things that can be uh, utilized in, and accelerated in the environment we're in. And I think there are things that smart investors and those who are looking towards the future can get ahead of where this is going and create real uh, value for broader sets of stakeholders and also create economic value for themselves and their investors. Such great points that you make, Lenny. Of course, I don't know if you saw me nodding vigorously when you talked about uh, the need to not have it all lay on the shoulders of working moms, since I am uh, trying to do this from the office in hopes of allowing my kids to continue their uh, at-home learning. And just down the street are my uh, parents who we relocated from Cambridge and I'm trying to help and be a support to them. So that really resonates with me and probably many other people as well. Uh, it's also interesting to think about where this all fits into this larger idea of all of the different elements that fit into work and business that aren't necessarily related to work and business. For instance, it is my belief that like our democracy and our economy are inextricably tied. And so we can think about all of the different things that become policy issues, but still affect how, you know, People, what people are expecting from work, what people need from work. Uh, if you think about benefits, if you think about healthcare and you think about things like that, that so often people are hoping to get uh, healthcare from the fact that they are employed and their employer is helping them uh, get that. But uh, I won't go too much further because I would love to hear what Hilad and Jess think as well, please. Um. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that the two are inextricably connected. Um, very often what people vote for is <laughs> um, for essentially a, a, a more, a better quality of life that is enabled primarily through business, through, through their engagement with, with the business. So you're voting for people in government to change the levers for how businesses behave so that your quality of life can be improved. So, um, and, and very often, uh, because of the way um, the financing of, of campaigns work and just the electoral process. Um, and, you know, businesses have an outsized influence in the way policy is shaped. So it's a, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a pretty, the feedback loops are not, <laughs> are not um, in the right direction. Uh, and, and, you know, to, to the COVID moment, I, I think, it's critical, like more than ever, basically, we've got governments are facing mounting social, environmental, and economic challenges simultaneously, you know, at a scale and complexity that they haven't really had to deal with before. Um, and we engage with a lot of different people in different governments. And, you know, there's a lot of like shoulders shrugging, and we really don't know the way out of this mess, actually. Um, so there, people are actually looking for solutions in ways that, that I think that there hasn't been this kind of opening in the past. Um, and the, the model of economic activity basically that can handle, you know, the, the, the 
basically economic, social, and environmental challenges simultaneously is the for benefit approach. So really the, the, the best way for governments to get out of this thing is to figure out how to unleash all the millions of entrepreneurs and investors and consumers and workers and innovators and academics and, and you know, um, people across the economy who wake up every morning thinking, how can I go out there and figure out a way to leverage um, markets to do good in the world um, and solve these problems? Like governments would be really well off figuring out in this moment how to unleash that, that innovative energy. Uh, and that requires choices that are different than the ones we're making. Did you have anything you wanted to add, Jess? Okay, okay. So I see a question here that is about the role of universal basic income as an element. But what I will add to this, because I think, and I don't know if this person was thinking of these things as well, but I'm, I'm curious about just all of the other ways in which we have kind of safety net services and provisions. I think it's also maybe a question about what about things like portable benefits and things like that. So I'm just curious, I'm gonna actually lump that in with some other questions um, as it relates to just what is the, the way that the safety net or different ways of uh, executing a safety net uh, fit into this, this concept. Um, I can start. That's a big question, obviously. Um, <clears throat> let me distinguish between the need for substantial, immediate, and targeted round of stimulus to support those who need it right now from a longer-term conversation about universal basic income. They're very different things. Um, in the United States, we unequivocally need uh, another round of targeted stimulus for those who most need it, including uh, direct payment to individuals who are unemployed um, or are struggling with the current environment and for helping support in a more effective and targeted way than PPP did, although it was important, um, our smaller businesses, particularly those who are uh, main street businesses and those owned by minority and women owners. Uh, we need that and we need it now. And the longer Congress diddles, and particularly the longer the Senate makes us a political issue as opposed to coming to a resolution, the worse off we're gonna be. I'm not optimistic in the short term. I am slightly more optimistic as we get through uh, the next two weeks that there will be serious conversations around that and it's essential. Um, I think that's very different from a conversation around universal basic income. Um, that's a different question around more to me, the right question as you described it, Autumn, is how do we create the safety net and the set of uh, systems that ensure that we've got an economy that works for everyone and that people aren't left out of that. Um, I do believe we need uh, a different conversation about safety net. To me, part of that includes portable benefits. It includes a higher minimum wage and higher EITC. And to me, it would include a definition of work that includes a broader set of things that are eligible for EITC, including large elements of uncompensated care today. If you did all of those things and then aligned and made it simpler to ensure that people are receiving the other benefits to which they're eligible in that safety net, that's a much more effective and targeted way to deliver what we're trying to accomplish than universal basic income, which is expensive, which is not targeted, and which will create the wrong kind of incentives around and a different definition of the dignity of work than one that actually creates a broader conversation around how do we ensure that people are utilizing their capabilities to the fullest and that they're appropriately compensated for the activity in a way that is aligned with what we're trying to accomplish as a society? Hirad or Jess, anything to add? Um, just one thought to add there. And um, I was just talking to a B Corp up in Canada um, earlier this morning, right before this call. And, um, some of her observations related to the differences between what she's seeing happen in the US and the impacts of that on the B Corp community in the US compared to Canada. And mm -hmm. I think what it highlights is that the lack of a safety net makes it incredibly difficult to tackle some of the long-term work that needs to be done. And so, and we see this even within B Corps who are working to be net zero, who have um, some long-term commitments who right now are stepping in to meet some of the most basic needs for their teams. And so um, 
one thing that just thinking of that contrast is where you have um, stronger safety nets, um, you spend less time chasing um, some of these really immediate concerns. And then, and, and we know that um, thinking about climate, um, thinking about long-term solutions to economic inequity um, takes long-term planning and sustained commitment. And when we are chasing some of these challenges and to the point of the impacts that COVID have had in the United States relative to other countries, um, we see that that can be an enormous distraction um, because the pressing challenges are so, um, so apparent. Um, and so that, that was just something that I wanted to, to highlight is we can look to countries with stronger safety nets as um, being able to do long-term sustained work towards the SDGs, um, towards climate change, um, things like that. And I'll add, add one small comment on top of that. Um, I think for governments, the fourth sector is also a tremendous opportunity for figuring out how to deliver a better safety net. So there's a whole tool set there of leveraging the for benefit enterprise model and in innovators and, and investors and, and, and folks who want to leverage market based solutions to delivering social value. Um, th there's a huge vista of opportunity to harness the fourth sector for that. I really appreciate all three of your answers to this um, question. And it actually brings us to a question that I see here. Let me see if I can say this appropriately. Let's see. So when you think of the fact that there are consumers and society at risk of going bankrupt from a lot of a slew of issues, unaffordability issues like healthcare, housing, college, transportation, transportation, retirement. How do we restructure economy to competitively achieve affordable market prices for these products and services without consumers having to borrow excessive amounts from private sector or without government having to subsidize at excessive levels? So it's kind of connected, which is what is the ability, and I know Hirad, you were just basically touching on this, but what is the ability of uh, a restructured economy to make the affordability of these different things we need um, more tenable. I'd love to have Hirad try and answer that. I, I will just start with particularly in the sectors that were outlined in that question around healthcare to some degree, uh, housing, particularly affordable housing or uh, college, transportation, retirement. I'd other other things like journalism, like our democracy infrastructure are all partly public goods. And when you set up a system that is disaggregating the role of government's uh, uh, financing and government's um, oversight from a private sector delivery, which is oriented around near-term profit, um, what do you think you're gonna get? You get for-profit colleges that actually have nothing to do with delivering the education objectives in many cases. And a healthcare system that's oriented towards uh, more delivery of services at more and more expensive cost than, than actually delivering uh, a better educated and relevant for work at, uh, workforce or health outcomes. Uh, and so I just think you have to think in the way that Hirad does around aligning those incentives so that that can occur. Um, I, I, a very tiny example for something that I'm involved with personally, um, it's not surprising that we have uh, most of our local news delivered and generated by people whose objective is short-term profit that they've just decimated local journalism. But if you said that's something that is partly a public good and how do we create for benefit enterprises that can deliver in a cost effective way, but its objective is partly to ensure the community benefit, what would happen? I think we could see a rejuvenation of a large number of locally oriented and ultimately at scale journalism if we thought differently about it and oriented our system as opposed to saying you're an extractive owner of a publishing enterprise into one that's uh, really oriented around the pub broader public good of local journalism. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll build on that. So I, I think if you look at the current economic system, th there, 
if you were an efficiency expert and you came and said, I'm going to restructure this economy to save money, you would find inordinate amounts of capital to save because there's so many feedback loops like, like the one Lenny was just talking about in journalism that are negative. So we have an industry that produces what, what they call food, you know, uh, snack food, which isn't really nutrition. The nutrition value of it is, is you know, negative uh, oftentimes. Uh, that people consume that gives them all kinds of healthcare problems that creates lots of burden on a healthcare system and a lot of money flowing to a healthcare system dealing with somewhere on the order of 80% of expenditures go towards chronic illnesses that are related to behavioral or lifestyle choices that people make, which are driven by consumer advertising by companies that are trying to sell stuff that is toxic to us, but profitable for investors. So, so much of the economy is, is, is like these kinds of really harmful feedback loops, the way it's currently constructed. So when you transition to a for benefit economy, the whole thing changes. Now you've got organizations that are, that are in the food business, those companies, their purpose is to improve the well-being and nutritional you know, um, input in the foods that they create, the well-being of the consumers who purchase and consume them and the farmers who grow them and the soil fertility and, you know, right, that's their purpose. That's what they exist for. So they don't create all these externalized costs on a system that end up basically the lion's share of the money that we spend on the, on the safety net and these essential um, services and, and goods that, that people rely on is, is basically wasted capital in, in this way. So for benefit economy would completely change that whole equation. And when you run a business on a for-benefit logic, it actually can be super competitive uh, relative to a for-profit one uh, with, a, with a much lower um, profit requirement. So when you're optimizing benefit for stakeholders. So that whole thing is, is, is just a fascinating economic model to study. But when every, basically an organization is, is as successful as its stakeholders affinity to it, right? So the more you attract and retain and grow stakeholder interest, the more you are effective as an organization. Well, for benefits, because they are a stakeholder, you know, their architecture is stakeholder driven. They exist to create benefit for all their stakeholders and optimize that. They're gonna attract more. So they're gonna scale faster and, and, and grow more robustly if they're, they have a, a, an ecosystem that's conducive. So the economic model in a, in a company like that is vastly different. You can, you can basically afford to provide, and you can see this in social entrepreneurs all over the world who've developed healthcare. Uh, for benefit models and, and food and, and other sectors. Um, they, can, they can basically figure out an economic model that provides at a much more affordable cost because affordability and access to their services is part of their mission. Uh, those same goods and services that for-profit counterparts cannot possibly compete on. Um, so yeah, I think the economics are completely different in a for-benefit economy and much more in favor of equity and access. Um, Hey, Rod, you aren't by chance insinuating that we take away people's Cheetos, are we? Because <laughs> I'm actually if, quite- If Zone Organics comes up with four benefit Cheetos and, and consumers <laughs> end up preferring the taste of that, everybody yeah. wins. Don't take anything away from everyone, just give them the opportunity to have competition. Got you. I have to say, I've never actually eaten a Cheeto ever in my life. Anywho, I digress. Um, my question for you, actually, let me just see, did Jess, did you have anything you wanted to add before I move on? Okay, great. So my last question for you is going to be about this idea of how do we continue to have this concept, this idea, this movement, if you will, kind of catch fire and be something that, well, I shouldn't say catch fire, we're in California, be something that people are excited about, want to get engaged in. Uh, and are there means that you would recommend, what would you want those listening to kind of share with others, with the people they speak to? And I wanted to, before even saying that, um, note that I have been really interested in hearing what Rebecca Henderson, who is a professor at Harvard Business School, wrote a piece back in July on reimagining capitalism and has a new book, uh, Reimagining Capitalism in a World on Fire. And so I am, interested in what each of you think is a way to have this move further and faster. And I'll start with Jess. Great, thank you. Um, my three-year-old just got home, so you might hear him in the background. Um, the, uh, 
as I think about this audience a little bit, um, what I think, the, the one thing that I can share is kind of like a takeaway is this um, policy agenda um, that we've recently um, released. And I, I think um, coming from the position of, you know, foundations, thought leaders, um, and the, the, that, that lens, though I think that there's lots of lenses as individual con consumers, there's a lens that we can take as um, business leaders, there's a the lens that we can take, but um, I think that there are, with legislative and with regulatory changes, there's an opportunity to kind of bake this um, need for stakeholder capitalism and to advance the work that we're that we're doing. And so, um, I what just what comes to mind is is it is a it is a big paradigm shift to think about on on raveling how we've understood the purpose of business for so long and I think for many of us how we've been trained to understand the purpose of business and um, so so it's kind of from whatever lens or lever that you're able to pull um, thinking about that in a much more expansive way um, and one concept we talk a lot about is interdependence and so we live in a pretty individualistic society and I think what we're seeing um, now in in more heightened ways is that we are all deeply interdependent on one another and um, to take a narrow view or a narrow understanding of capitalism is to not see what's right in front of us that without taking seriously our commitment to the environment to each other to our communities um, we won't experience the long-term quality of life that I think we we want and so um, so uh, I can share this um, policy agenda. There's a ton of great resources out there. And um, whether you're thinking about it from the government lens, from your own kind of individual life, what, who, who are the businesses that you're supporting um, and what decisions are you making to kind of, uh, we talk about voting every day with where you work, um, with who you buy from, um, the businesses that you support. Um, I think that there's, there's a lot that we can be doing to um, think about the responsibility that, that business that um, our market forces have um, to making the world a better place and not just making more, more money. So. Thank you so much for that. Uh, Hira, do you wanna share your final word and your final thoughts of? Uh, sure. Um, I would say basically, if you believe that, that capitalism needs to be reimagined and, and, and reformed and renewed, um, then, you know, lend your voice and and your your um, effort, <laughs> your hands um, and your capital, if you can, to policy reforms and market reform efforts that actually help help cause that to happen. Um, there is a, a, as I said earlier, I think a, a narrow, uh, potentially very narrow moment uh, in time where we have the opportunity to make the kind of pivot that's required. Uh, before the, 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 the challenges we're facing get exponentially worse and our capacity to respond in, in a systemic way you know, becomes severely diminished. Um, so I, you know, it, this is just a very important time to ask ourselves, what is it we can do to help advance these kinds of reforms if we see the need for them? Um, and, and I would invite anybody who's interested, we, we actually are in a, in a collaborative effort with a number of other networks and organizations called the Build Better Economy Challenge. It's essentially a, a policy hackathon to help co-create uh, policy solutions for governments around the world to help them figure out how to uh, direct their stimulus and, and recovery strategies in the direction of, of this kind of a new economy and capitalism. And the, the URL for that is buildbetter.world slash challenge. So would invite anybody interested in uh, checking that out and getting involved. Thank you so much, Autumn, for convening this conversation. Thank you. And Lenny. So um, briefly, I think there are two things that would be on my mind to accelerate this. Um, and remember, as we said from the beginning, this isn't something that's going to happen overnight. So we need to think about catalyzing something that will occur over time. But those catalytic events can be really important. And I think the election in 2020 will be one of those. Um, and so I would revisit this conversation in 2021, where hopefully we're thinking about much more along the lines of what Hirad was suggesting about 
a better economy than trying to just uh, stimulate our way so that we can uh, we, we can barely get through something and go back to what we were before. Um, there is a real opportunity and it hopefully be enabled by different mindset in Washington to say, how do we use this moment to really create it, particularly if we're going to have large scale government investment to something that incents the kind of things that we're talking about as opposed to just uh, having us hobble along. Uh, the second thing is if you believe that that could happen, uh, and even better if you believe it will happen, I think there's an important opportunity for capitalists, particularly uh, forward-looking investors with a long-term view, to think about what, what can I do to harness my investment capacity to help take advantage of this and even accelerate it. As I said before, in things like what uh, analytically, if you're pricing in all of these things that we say should be part of how capitalists make decisions, if that's the way it's gonna go and you were doing it, how would you shift your portfolio? What kinds of new ventures would you invest in? What would your disposition of things that you think are underpriced and could be better led if they were oriented around that mindset be? And where are there places where there's something that is really interesting, but if scaled could have enormous impact. I think those are all really interesting opportunities. I think there's a lot of uh, uh, opportunities to have the kind of reimagined capitalism and a better economy, both be good for the society that we want to live in and also an attractive investment opportunity. I think we're going to need both of those things, a policy environment that, that catalyzes it and investors and uh, capitalists that are prepared to use their resources to accelerate it. Well, I think the three of you have given the, the final word, the word that I think is uh, hopefully really encouraging to all of those who are listening. <clears throat> and I thank all of you for joining us and a, a special thank you to you, Lenny, Hilad, and Jess.